yeah, he's doing much better. Uh, just kept him home, make sure nothing's still there. Absolutely. That was, that was a good call. So I want you to keep praying for, for Samuel. And I wanted to mention that as we go into prayer time. Well, who is your friend today? Well, this is my granddaughter, Avery. Yes, it is. <laughs> and she just turned seven. <laughs> and I'm going to ask her one question. What did you say your favorite food was at the fair? Cotton candy. Yes, yes. There it is. Spread from ear to ear. <laughs> Okay, as we go into prayer time this morning, we want to remember our, our brothers and sisters, uh, not only still in Houston, that are, are uh, dealing with the reconstruction of their facilities and their homes, but also for those in harm's way in Florida. Uh, coming across the Keys this morning, as you probably know, it, it was going to hit between Key West and Marathon, and then go up the West Coast and then make a turn. Uh, it looks like North Carolina is going to be spared. Uh, however, but uh, for the most part, we'll get rain and wind. And um, on our way over, Avery was talking to me. She said, Papa, she said, what about that hurricane? And I said, it's going to miss us, but we need to pray. So we prayed on the way up here this morning, and it was so sweet to pray with you. And she said, well, I don't really know how. And I said, well, just follow me. And so and we did that together. So um, maybe that's special. Um, Somebody asked me this morning and said, well, aren't you glad you're not working in Florida and delivering all the mail? I said, no, but I got every bit of it on my floor. I mean, I'm moving any of it down there. Uh, so, in um, this time, who wants a bill, right, at this time? So, um, anyway, keep your, your thoughts and prayers in, in place for those guys in, in Florida as they go through this the next couple of days and as it moves up the coast and in the inland as well. So let's go for it. Our Father, we just come to you today just uh, just praising your name for how great you are. And dear God, we just want to thank you for all that you do for us. We want to pray, dear God, that this morning that you will be with the people in Florida uh, as the storm Irma comes up the, up the coast. And also as it makes a turn and goes inland, we pray for those other states and families as well. We pray, oh God, that uh, you will just keep people safe and, and people will heed the instructions of the local facilities and get out of get out of harm's way as much as possible. We pray, oh God, this morning for those that are here. We pray uh, for those that might have friends and family in Florida or in other states where they'll be impacted. We pray, oh God, that you will keep those families safe. We pray, dear God, this morning for our pastor as he comes and brings us a message, and that you'll just be with him and you give him all the boldness to bring uh, proclaim your message this morning. Dear God, we also want to pray for those that are here this morning. If, if there's one here that does not know you as our Lord and Savior, that today would be the day they'd make the decision to put their hand in yours and to walk the rest of their life with you in the, uh, for eternity. Of course, in your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, Avery. You did really good. That was awesome. Um, okay, announcement time. If you would get your bulletins, if you have a bulletin, maybe you can turn to that colored page with the pictures. That's my favorite page. Um, also, I'm reminded that the Panthers play today because Cam Newton and Kelvin Benjamin are here with us this morning. Always good to have the Panthers with us. I was also reminded uh, of, actually my wife reminded me, today is, what's the date today? 9-10, right? So what's tomorrow? Do you remember that? Everybody remember that? And, and the thing is, uh, I, I don't want to forget that. I don't want to forget that. Day. I want to remember. I want to remember. It's good for us to remember things. Things that help keep us focused, keep our attention on things that, that should be. So, uh, and something else for us to be thinking about is, is, uh, is 911. Okay. Some announcements. Uh, some of these will not be in your bulletin, and I wanted to mention a couple of things. Our seniors group has been meeting for two weeks now, and, and they've been working hard at coming up with a name and planning some activities. They meet Wednesday at 10 o'clock. Now, the biggest thing about this group is uh, they do have a name now. Uh, I had to veto the first name because it was a little bit discolorful. But, you know, with this group, what do you expect? But they did come up with a name, and it's called the Classics, right? So we are the Classics. 
at the classics meet at 10 o'clock every Wednesday at the bar. Now, this week, we're having breakfast this week, right? Biscuits and gravy. So if you're free at 10 o'clock Wednesday, join me at the barn because I'm going to have some of Miss Sue's biscuits and gravy. And y'all are welcome to come. This is a fun group and we're going to do a lot of neat things. You don't have to be a senior to come. You do not have to be a senior to come. So, okay, awesome. So the classics will meet Wednesday at 10 o'clock for biscuits and gravy. All right. Um, let me go through the, the list. By the way, I have my new shipment of daily breads. These are these are three months at a time. So I have September, October, November. They're here. They're over at the the uh, information table. So please go pick one or two up if you want to give one to a friend. This is a daily devotional, and it's been around for a long time. And I love I just love the simplicity of this devotional. If you don't have a devotional that you use, I would really recommend you take a couple of these. And this is September, October, November. Please go by over here at the table and get you one. And, and maybe give one to a friend as well. All right. Um, Night of Hope is September 16th. That is this Saturday at the Big Barn. This is where we partner with Farrell and the, the Hope Project. This is our ministry in Nicaragua, we went down and built a church. Our missions team has been down there. And I would like to invite everybody, Saturday night, 5 o'clock I believe, is that right? Yeah. 5 o'clock at the Big Barn. Really want you to come. Now, if you are if you can bring a dessert, all right, we, we, that's that's what we're doing, right, is bring dessert. Maylin, stand up. She has a list. And so if you have not signed up to bring a dessert, please see her. That will be real helpful for us to bring a, a wonderful, fattening, healthy, healthy less dessert for our Saturday night's banquet. Night of Hope. Really want to encourage that. It's going to be a fun time. Also, our next place weekend is coming up September 22 and 23. And we need a little bit of clarification. If you have signed up or if you plan to go, where is my friend Sue? Sue is right here. I need you to go see her. She's going to be standing at the exit over here on your way out, even if you've already signed up, right? Yes. Go by and verify and make sure that we have you on our list. And if you have not yet gone through a place weekend, I really want to encourage you to do that. We, we want everyone in this church family to come and go through a place we get. It's Friday night and Saturday morning. It is awesome. It will, it's a life changer. And if you're new, perhaps you've been visiting and you've not, not gotten real plugged into everything, this is a great place for you to start. So please come by and see Sue uh, for our next place we get. Anything else on that? We're good? All right. Good. Um, our musical coming up, Unstoppable Musical, is September 24. That will be coming up, and this will be really exciting. And let's see, I think that may be all of our announcements. Okay. Sometimes I forget things while I try to write it down, but I think we're good. Um, I enjoyed watching some of our kids at, at rec football yesterday at the middle school. We got guys that play, we got girls that cheer, and I love it. You guys, we're so proud of you. We're so proud of our church family, our church kids, and, and we're thankful. So thank you. If you're our guest, thank you for being here today. We're going to have a great time together. What we're going to do now is take a little break and get the kids all in the class that will come back right here. If you need to get a snack, go get one. Take a break, and uh, we'll get back here in just a little bit. All right. Let's get started with our second portion before we go into another worship set. I am glad Paige is on today. Hi, Paige. Good to see you. Paige is a world traveler. I'm glad she's home. Um, all right. Let me, let me follow up on a couple of announcements and then, then we have a, a surprise for you and uh, did some more good music, okay? Um, tonight, 
back to our schedule, back to our uh, really our focus on three main things. All of our rehearsals are tonight, right? And we start at four. All that should be in your bulletin. And if you do music and you want to do choir and worship and orchestra and all that, all the rehearsals tonight. And again, if you'd like to start, we'd love to get you plugged into that. So well, I don't know. We'll just, just show up. We can get you plugged in. Also, uh, youth group meets tonight at 6 o'clock. That will be our middle school and high school. All of our students in middle school and high school parents, please bring your kids to youth group at 6 o'clock. It's going to be an incredible fall, some neat activities. And uh, so I really encourage you, if you are a parent of a middle schooler or a high school student, 6 o'clock tonight at the barn. And then uh, also prayer and planning tonight at 6 o'clock. Some really important things. Uh, lots of news, lots of things with our new potential uh, facility here in town. is, is a big thing tomorrow night coming up on that with the commissioners. And so we'll be keeping you up on all of that. But prayer and planning tonight at 6 o'clock. And the other thing is we're starting a new ministry uh, this fall called the Network Ministry. Some of you have been contacted about leading and helping us with the network ministry. If you have been contacted about the network ministry, I need you to meet us next Sunday night, the 17th at 6 o'clock. It, it'll be during our prayer planning time, and we're going to do a more detailed training and explanation of the network ministry the 17th, one week from tonight, 6 o'clock. Okay? So if you have been contacted about the network ministry, 17th, 6 o'clock. We will help you to learn more and understand uh, all that's going on there. Now, I, I have a special treat for you guys today. Let's see. Let's go with Blue okay, Mark? Blue? Good. Um, I have a, a, one of my heroes is here today and his daughter. And Gerald Zemer is, is with us today from Romania. Now, a couple weeks ago we had a lady from Poland. Today we have friends from Romania. Gerald and, and his daughter Karina are here. Gerald's going to tell us a little bit about what's going on in Romania. They've been with us before, but I think we were still in the barn in our early days. And uh, Gerald is one of my heroes. He, he uh, started coaching him in elementary school. He was a gunner. And uh, he was in basketball. That means he shot a lot. And he, but he was good though. And so he, he, we coached him, and he was in my youth group, and he grew up to really love God and follow God hard and seriously. And he's been a missionary now for a long time in Romania, and, and he has come through, stayed with us last night, and I wanted him to give you guys an idea of what's going on in Romania. So will you help me welcome Gerald Zemer, please? Amen. Well, what an opportunity uh, to know and to serve a God that is alive and real. My parents are in Tampa, Florida, so we're praying for them today that uh, God will watch over and protect them. My daughter Karina is here with me this morning. Karina, stand up. They got your picture up there, but stand up. She's second year in college, so I got to come back from Romania to take this year. And, uh, she'll be in the Word of Life Bible Institute in Scream Lake, New York. I understand you guys are starting Word of Life Club here, and we were working and involved in those when we were in college as well. But um, 36 years ago, I was in sixth grade, and Coach Snow was my, was my elementary basketball. Ray Kersey, he's here. I think he's on the same team. Right back in the back. Yeah, we were there. But uh, Romania, Eastern Europe, Orthodox country. You walk down the street, the average person will tell you they're a Christian because they were born into an Orthodox home. They were baptized as a baby. They were Christianized, therefore they're a Christian. To differentiate between them and us, they call us repenters, us evangelicals repentance, because we stress repentance is necessary for salvation. And uh, so the opportunity of ministering and working there in Romania, God has blessed in an incredible way. Um, I have some pictures over here of some of the people that God has brought to Himself, working in the town of Fundula, where God did a great work through the drowning of a young man. And through that drowning, his family, one after another, came to, met, came to meet Jesus Christ, and their lives were changed. Ministering the town of Fundula, the church began to grow, and a man came in one Sunday. And he said, now that we've we're an established local church, you have to have 21 members, according to the government, to be a local church. He said, is it okay if we plant a church somewhere? I said, that's a great great, great uh, um, consideration. Where would you consider doing it? He said, well, we've been witnessing the people. We've been selling our fruits and vegetables next to in the markets in Bucharest. They invited us to come to their town and teach us the Bible. 
we think that'd be a good, good place to start. So we began going to see an action plan at the church there, and we're seeing God bring people to himself. But we have the opportunity of sharing in a, in a location. The county that we live in has 148 cities, villages, towns. 124 have no evangelical witness whatsoever, no evangelical church. And so it's a place where they're uh, ripe for harvest, ripe for opportunities to share the gospel, and God is opening door after door for us to go and to share the gospel. Our most recent outreach is in a town called Valle Argove. This town of about 3,000 people where we had the opportunity to go and minister there was at the invitation of a lady who we were in a previous town doing evangelistic work on a soccer field and uh, meeting in someone's home for evangelistic or for, for Bible teaching. And uh, as we were there doing an evangelistic outreach for four days, five days, <laughs> Monday to Friday, um, there was a situation where a, a man had gone to a, a baptism of a baby in the Orthodox Church and gotten drunk through that event, gone home and beaten his wife who was eight months pregnant. She lost the baby that night and she lost her life on Wednesday. And in reaching out to that family that week, I sat beside her casket that Friday night, and her sister from this other town was there, and she said, you know what, people used to come to our town, and they used to teach us the Bible, but nobody's come in, in almost a year. Can you guys come, or can you send someone to teach us the Word of God? Opportunities. Opportunities that God has placed in front of us. And uh, we would love for you guys to, uh, to be a part of what God is doing in the country of Romania. Um, we are unworthy vessels, but God cleans and cleanses us and allows us to be involved in what He has done. 2 Corinthians 4, 7, it says we have this treasure in these earthen vessels or these jars of clay, these human bodies that we indwell, so that when people hear about the great things God is doing in Romania, He will be the one who gets the glory and He will be the one that is praised. And uh, we rejoice in what God is doing here in Mount Pleasant. As the coach mentioned, I, I call him coach, you call him pastor. He was my coach first. And uh, coach mentioned, um, we were here a couple years ago, and I think they were just putting the first door on the, the building over there, and uh, excited to see I'm on your Facebook page where you guys update things that are going on and to see how God keeps bringing people uh, uh, beside you in your ministry here and how God is continuing to work and uh, challenge you. Remain faithful, keep loving the Lord, keep loving each other, reaching out to those around you. Um, your Jerusalem, your Judea, Samaria, and also to Romania is about the last stop on the bus. So uh, we'd love to have you guys come over and minister alongside of us. God has given us the opportunity to build a camp. We had over 950 people this summer. Many of them are young children that would never have the possibility of paying to go to a camp, but we raised funds to take those children to camp. And what an awesome opportunity to be able to let those children come and put 15 good meals in front of them, let them sleep in a nice bed for five days all by themselves, because back home there's usually two or three siblings in one bed. And uh, I'm not talking about abuse of children, but many of those children would minister too. If they do not help produce income for the family, that family's not going to eat that week. And uh, for those children to come to camp and just to be a child and run and play and have a wonderful time is an incredible opportunity. But more than that is the opportunity to put the Word of God in front of them and share the love of Jesus Christ with them. And here, years later, those children, when they decide to follow the Lord in baptism, say, I met Jesus Christ at... And he mentions our camp, Camp Eli. And that's just an awesome opportunity we have. And we're always looking for teams to come over in the summertime, help us run a week of camp for children, come with a VBS-style curriculum for five days, and you're going to teach the Bible lessons, run the activities, do the crafts and games with the kids. We've got the campers, the camp, the counseling, the counselors, translators, food service staff. We've just got to come with a heart open to, um, to love on these children. And by the end of the week, you guys that have been overseas on missions trips and you've met children and worked with them, you know what that's all about. But uh, we're so excited what God is doing here in, in uh, Mount Pleasant. And uh, thank you for loving on Coach. He's right back there somewhere. Um, but uh, we're far away. But have been 22 years in Romania. God is blessed in a special way. Thankful for what God is doing. God bless you guys. I really would like you to go by afterwards and see Gerald and Karina and... Uh, See, for those of you that didn't believe I ever coached, I really did. <laughs> we were good, too. We were good, weren't we, Ray? We, we went several years without losing a game. Now, you know, I'm all kind and loving and all that now, sometimes, but when you get me coaching again, that's why I had to give it up. We, we were good, though, I promise you that. I really want you to go by and see Gerald and, and uh, when I was a young kid, 
a little child in the hills of Tennessee running around up in the mountains. Um, listen, Mount Pleasant is a booming metropolis compared to Oakdale, Tennessee. There was not much up there. Snow Hill, actually. And I never realized there was a really big world out there. I never realized that. I thought this, my little world was just the hills of Tennessee, my little community. And I, I really think that our church, there's, there's something very important that God wants us to do here, and that is use our influence for the kingdom of God. And I want to tell you something, church. This is bigger than Mount Pleasant. We have an opportunity to reach the world from this place right here in Mount Pleasant through people like Gerald and his family. And I will, I believe within the DNA of the Community Church of Mount Pleasant is a, is a passion for missions. And I will always continue to bring people here in front of you that help us get a better view of, of a big world without Jesus. And so I just, people like Gerald are my heroes. I haven't given up much to serve Jesus. I'm pretty spoiled. And somebody who walks away from their life here to go to places like that, I just appreciate that. And so I can partner. I can be a part. And so missions team, I want you to get to know Gerald. And someday I want us to go to Romania. And I want us to go to Brazil. I want us to go to South Africa. And wherever God helps us go, to tell people about Jesus, to give them hope and love. So thank you for that. Now, we're going to worship and uh, get ready to move into our message. Thank you again for being here today. Now join us as we worship. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Y'all look good. Y'all know that? <laughs> About to pull out a beer and look at yourself. <laughs> About uh, 25, 25 years ago, so then I went overseas for the first time. Oh, first time I'd ever been to overseas. First time I'd ever flown any full anywhere. I think it's the first time I've been anywhere besides Myrtle Beach. I grew up like that. Before the July week. Bill's closed down and went to Myrtle Beach. But needless to say, the food was a little different than what I was accustomed to. And I grew up on pinto beans and fried potatoes and cornbread. And on a good day, you had spam. <laughs> I'm laughing because y'all did the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't have any more money than we did. I thought Mama fried the spam thin and crispy because that's the way I liked it. She said, no, son, I fried it thin and crispy because of this poor man to make it go as long as we could. <laughs> but we're sitting over there in Poland and we were helping with this uh, youth camp that some missionaries over there were running. And uh, the food was just different, you know? Just, Different feel, different taste. Usually it was cold because we got there late. It was like, you know, I may be skinny, but I travel on my stomach. You know? Every lunch, uh, every supper, I'd be like, hmm, here we go again. But we were there for two weeks, and one of those first few days, they brought out the place and they brought out cold slaw. I don't like coleslaw. I really don't. I don't like mayonnaise. But, eh, it's coleslaw. It's but I was desperate at this point, dietetically speaking. Okay, I'll try coleslaw. I'll try it. That's the best stuff I've ever had to eat in my entire life. I don't like coleslaw. But it's funny how you remember things. I remember 25 years. I can still taste that coleslaw in my mouth. Because it was the best thing I had for two weeks. And I hope every day, I hope we're going to have coleslaw. Because <laughs> it was always my favorite thing on my plate. And then what the heck does that have to do with anything? And in Psalm 34, 8, it says, Taste and see that the Lord is what? So regardless of what is on your plate this morning, you may be looking at your plate of life this morning thinking, hmm, I don't know about all this. The Lord is good. Amen? Amen. And you may be here this morning looking at your plate thinking, dog, I got it made. I 
got Hostess cupcakes. I got some of those little Dunkin' stick things that Tony brings back there. You know, if that's your life right now, then you remember this. All good things come from who? Come from good ones. Stand up and worship this morning.
that's a man that is so secure with himself, you know. <laughs> that has nothing to do with anything. I was reminded that today is Grandparents' Day. Did y'all know that? Did y'all know that? So, uh, Mom, stand up. There we go. story one of these days. So, all right, if you're a grandparent, stand up. Love you, Lele. Aww. And I would probably go out on live and say you probably have pictures of the grandkids that you'd be willing to show us or have your phone and whatever. So, thank you, grandparents. Thank you for for being uh, strategic in passing on the, the legacy to, to love Jesus, go to church, be faithful, follow God to your family, your children, and your grandkids. We need you. We need you. Um, 1 Samuel chapter 17 today, if you'd open your Bibles to 1 Samuel 17. We're going to talk about, this is sermon number two, and young David. Now, later, we'll do some more about David, but these three weeks we're going to do a study on young David as he was coming into uh, the, 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 the journey, the path that God had for him. And so I want you to open up to 1 Samuel 17. It's a great story today. Uh, on the wall over here, you will see some posters. A couple weeks ago, we had an, a leadership conference here at our church. It was called Ignite. And, and we were discussing several things. And we had a segment and we talked about being uniquely better as a church. And so um, there, are, there are many, 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 many churches, many kinds of churches. There's denominational things in churches. And all churches are different. That's okay. All churches aren't supposed to be just alike. They're not cookie cutters. So we talked about our church, the Community Church of Mount Pleasant. And we talked about some things, some concepts that made our church different that's what it means by being unique. We, we certainly are a unique church. We're different in many ways. But it, it's, it's not enough. It's, it's not, there's nothing spiritual about being different. Different doesn't necessarily mean good. Different might mean not so good. But our church is unique in many ways. And, and our thought was, how can we be and how are we uniquely better? So, we, I like to be different, but I don't want to be different just to say, hey, we're different. We do something different than you do, therefore we're better. That, that's not my point. My point is, how can we be uniquely better? And I always want us to be as a church looking in the mirror, thinking about who we are and what we do and why do we do it and how do we do it. And let's, let's assess, always be thinking about how, what are we here for and how can we do what we do better. And there's some thoughts that we brought up and, and, and I want to touch on these as we go forward. Um, one of the things was family time. It, it's different that we have our babies and our kids and it's noisy and we have kids dancing and singing and crying and all that. That's different. I like it. I, I, that's, that's a part of who we are. Um, we have prayer and planning on Sunday nights, which is different. I don't really know of another church that does that same kind of thing on Sunday nights. We have some strategic planning time, and we have a devotional time, and we have prayer. We pray. We don't just have someone lead us in prayer. We, we pray. We spend about an hour, usually an hour and a half, praying. That's unique. I think it's probably uniquely better. Um, there's a lot of other things that make our church different. And we want to always stay focused on, not because we want to be better than some other church, not that at all. Because we want to be the best that we can be for our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know what? The, the coach in me says, anybody can be average. 
It don't take a lot to be average. I don't think Jesus wants us to be average. I don't think that's enough. <coughs> I promise you this, Jesus Christ was not average. He was anything but average. As a church, I, I don't want to be average. I want to be excellent. Not because of us, because of Him. When we do something, let's do it with excellence. Because it's for Jesus. It's not just for us. And so there's some things. If you want to take the time to go by and look at some of those concepts, I think it's fun. And we'll continue to talk about being uniquely better. I want to talk today about David and Goliath, the ultimate underdog story. What is an underdog? You might know. That means when you're when you're expected to lose, you're an underdog. I, I remember uh, there used to be a cartoon. Did anybody old enough to remember the cartoon Underdog? <laughs> that was a good one. Um, underdog. That means you're, you're, if you, if you, none of you in here would ever bet. I'm just, you know, I'm sure. But Vegas has lines on things. And there are always people that are supposed to win and people that are supposed to lose. And David was probably the greatest underdog of all time. And we'll, we'll see that in a minute. But I was thinking about underdogs. And I was thinking about the great upsets. See, when David slew Goliath, nobody expected it. That was a huge upset. I mean, Vegas would have went shut down on that. And if you would have happened to be the one that put something on David, you would have been rich. Because that wasn't ever supposed to happen. That was a huge upset. And of course, being the sports guy that I am, there are certain upsets in history that, re that I remember. I remember when the U.S. beat the Soviets in the Olympics. Does anybody remember that? Oh, yeah. That was 1980. I remember watching that game. Nobody thought it could happen. And the time kept passing like, oh, wow, we're, we better enjoy this. Take a picture of the scoreboard. We're ahead. And the time kept passing, and they won. And it was unbelievable because nobody ever gave the U.S. a chance at beating the Soviets in ice hockey. Uh, 1969, the New York Jets beat the Baltimore Colts in the Super Bowl. An arrogant, cocky guy named Joe Namath <laughs> boldly predicted, we're going to beat the Colts. And everybody laughed. Villanova beat Georgetown in 1985 in the NCAA championship. Unbelievable. Nobody gave Villanova a chance against mighty Georgetown. Some of you may remember Buster Douglas knocked out Mike Tyson for the heavyweight championship in 1990. Anybody remember that? Yes, I remember that. Huge upset. Huge upset. And for those of you who are UFC people, you're a little skewed that way if you're a UFC person. Holly Holm defeated Ronda Rousey. Nobody. Nobody saw that one coming, Lou Ann. That was, that was huge. And then for some of you, it was 2007. It was fall in Ann Arbor. And Appalachian State beat Michigan at Michigan. Michigan. Appalachian App State. That's a huge upset. Where's, where's Barry? He's of course he wouldn't be here when I talk about it. You may not remember. I, 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 I'm a big Olympics guy. There was a wrestler. In 2000, his name was Rulon Gardner, and and he beat this probably another Russian, and this guy had never been beaten. He was a giant, and he was upset. It was a miracle. And then in 1983, in the NCAA championship, any NC State people here? Woo! You know. You know. Robert. <laughs> Coach Balvano, right? Yeah. This was the 
the, the fly jam of whatever Houston was. They were dunking on everybody and state beat them for the national championship. Miracle. Major upset. Now see, there were no upsets with North Carolina because North Carolina was always supposed to win. So there, there were no upsets there. They, they, they were the, the, the <laughs> and then in 1982, there was a guy named Ralph Sampson who played for Virginia, and they were pretty good, and he was like 18 feet tall. And they went and played in this tournament, and they got beat by a school called Chaminade. Nobody ever, there's not even a school called Chaminade. And they beat Ralph Sampson in Virginia. I could go on. Look, seriously, I, got, I could do this all day. But I'll... Because there's an even bigger upset in the Bible. And we're going to study it today. This guy named David, who we started learning about last week, how God chose this, this guy. His, his, God was disappointed with, with King Saul because King Saul had turned his heart against God. He had turned his heart away from God. Israel wanted a king, and God gave him a king. And, and the king became arrogant and self-sufficient, and he turned his heart toward, uh, away from God. And, and God told Samuel, he said, Samuel, who was his prophet, I want you to go out to Bethlehem in the country and you find Jesse. And you, one of his sons is gonna, I'm going to ordain as the new king of Israel. And he brought them all, he lined seven of them up, and, and, and Samuel said, well, that one's a good, he's a tall, he's a, he is king material. And God said, nope, next. And all seven of them, and God said, no. And Samuel is frustrated. He said, Jesse, <coughs> is this it? And Jesse's like, well, you know, I got one more boy out there. He's young, kind of rough. He's watching the sheep. What's his name? His name is David. Samuel said, bring him in. As soon as he came in, God said, that's my boy. That's my boy. And even then, he was the underdog. He was the youngest, the least likely. You know how in your senior class you have the most likely to succeed? David was the least likely to succeed. But he was the one God chose to be the next leader for his people. Unbelievable story. That's David. So today... 1 Samuel 17, we're going to study about this young guy named David. And we're going to learn some lessons about an underdog that was incredible. I, I won't read the whole chapter. I would like for you to. There are 58 verses in this chapter. So I hope you read 16, chapter 16. This week, at some point, maybe break it up through the week. I'd like you to read 1 Samuel chapter 17. You, you Listen. I can't tell you anything that will impact your life more than reading God's Word. And, and here's the problem with that. That is so trite. It's so obvious we don't do it. It's, it's so simple we don't do it. So can I just encourage you to read God's Word. It's life-changing. It's powerful. This week, 1 Samuel 17. I'm going to read a few verses, though. I want to talk to you about a couple verses, and then we'll, we'll go into some dialogue here and, and talk about this amazing story. The ultimate underdog. The upset of all time. And, and there already have been some, some big upsets this year, and there will be many, many more. Because college football is a crazy game and it drives people crazy and it's stressful. But this one was the biggest one of all time. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Let me start with verse 29 and I want to just, just hit a couple of high notes here and then we'll go through some, some more description. Verse 29, and, and David shows up and he sees the big guy out there and he's like, uh, what, what's, what's everybody's problem with this big guy? You know, he is, a, he is in, intimidating and he's, he's a bully. He's just a bad guy. And David shows up and, and David said in verse 29, What have I now done? And they're like, David, why are you here? Did you come down? Why are you even here? You go back and watch your little sheep, little David. What are you doing here? And David said, What am I doing here? Is there not a cause? 
And he's in there looking at the giant, the enemy, and he sees all the army and all the soldiers. And David said, Guys, is there not a cause here? Do y'all not hear this? Can you not? Are you? He's mocking you. Something rose up inside of David. And, and it, it overcame him. And it, it, it was amazing in his heart. There was a fire in his heart, in his belly. And he couldn't contain himself. And he said in verse 29, Is there not a cause? You know what I think our problem is a lot of times? I think that we're just not very inspired. Oh, i got to go to work today. Oh, and you're just not really inspired. But you go and you walk your way and you go through the motions and you kind of maybe hate it and you're just not really inspired. Well, David shows up and he sees this big bully and he sees all his army and says, What's wrong with you guys? Is there not a cause? Wow. That stirs me up. <coughs> and then we move down to verse 45. And David goes out and he says to the giant, the bully, he says, then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and a spear and a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast mocked. He says that to the bull. Man, I'm going to tell you something. This, this kid... And I believe, I really believe that when Samuel anointed him, he began to become empowered with the Holy Spirit of God. Because he was doing uncommon things as a young guy. And so he, he basically called out the giant. He said, look dude, I know you've got a big old sword and a big shield and you've got your armor and you're a big bully and all that. I'm coming in the name of the God of Israel. The Lord. And then we move down to verses 50 and 51 in the, in the latter part of this story. And this is kind of the, how it all ended. So David prevailed over the Philistine. He whipped him. He beat him. Because he had a bigger sword? No. Because he had better technology? David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. And he smoked the Philistine. And he slew him. He killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, I love this. David ran. When you're inspired, you know, you, you, know, you watch your kids. Okay. Uh, hey, get in here and clean up your room. It is slow motion. It is major slow motion. Hey, uh, what, and, then, and then you say something like, Hey, you want ice cream? Boom, it is on. He becomes inspired. And so, verse 51 says, Therefore, after he smote, killed, slew the bully, David ran. If you get excited enough, you'll run. There are some things in life that will excite you enough to run. David was inspired. He ran and he stood up on the Philistine and he took his sword and drew it out of the, the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head. Now I know that's a little graphic. I'm sorry for some... I don't mean to... I'm just telling you, that's what happened. This is war, folks. He cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they ran. That's the story. That's the greatest underdog in history. Young David. Let me talk a couple things, point a couple things out, and then we'll be finished today about this incredible story. If you have your bulletin, there's a little outline there. 
it, it may get in your way, uh, don't worry about it, but if you want to follow, there's some points there that will help us explain a little bit of the description of this story. Number one, we see the combatants. The Israelites and the Philistines, here they are. And there's this big valley in this area. Mary and I were able to go there. My son lived in Israel for a year. We were able to go in that valley where David slew Goliath. And there's a big valley. It's like a, it's like a arena. It's like a big football stadium. And so there's two banks. There's two hills. And then there's a valley in the middle. And, and so here's the Philistines, the bad guys. And then here's the Israelites, God's people. And so the Philistines are bullies. And they're coming over because they want to take over and... And, and grab and steal and, and they want to take over the land of the Israelites. And there's the two armies, the Israelites and the Philistines. And they're, they're, they're set out for battle. They're pitched there on the two banks. And there's this valley in between, the, the battlefield. Philistines on one side of the hillside, cross the valley, and, and a brook in the middle below on the other side is the valley, the, the, battle, the army of Israel. King Saul is the leader of Israel. So here's Israel, and they're looking over at the end. It's a unique thing. Battles were different then, because they didn't just go out in tanks and blow each other up. They fought. And so here's the, the valley and the brook, and you're looking at your enemy over there. And it's, it's a distance away, but you're looking at him every day. And so that's the two. The good guys and the bad guys, the ultimate good guys versus the bad guys. The soldiers of Israel were terrified. They were scared because of their enemies, the Philistines. It was a standoff, each awaiting the other first move. The Philistines had marched boldly right into the land of Israel and they were going to take over. <laughs> Number two, the challenge. So, the Philistines had a champion. His name was Goliath. He was a bully. He was a big, he was a champion. He was their guy. Each day, a huge giant strode out, into, out to the Philistines from the Philistines' camp. He was nine and a half feet tall. Now, uh, there's some big guys. There's some big guys that wrestle. There's some big basketball players. There's some big old football dudes. But this guy was nine and a half feet tall. Think about the biggest guy you know. This guy was nine and a half feet tall. And he was a big guy too. He, he wore a big, huge bronze helmet. A 200-pound coat of armor, which would stop arrows and spears. His coat was had it was made of small metal plates that overlapped like scales on a fish to protect him from from spears and arrows. <coughs> he had heavy metal shoes, which came all the way up his legs to protect them. His back was covered with a big piece of brass. He he was. His armor was in, it was, you couldn't penetrate it. He was the ultimate fighting machine before Arnold Schwarzenegger. He was the, you couldn't, you, it was impossible. There was no hope. There was no weakness with this guy. His, he carried a long bronze spear, several inches thick. The tip was a 25 pound iron spearhead. The tip, 25 pounds. His javelin and sword slung over his shoulder. His armor bearer walked ahead of him with a huge shield. Every morning and evening, Goliath would come out and mock the Israelites, daring their champion to show himself. Choose a man of Israel to come and fight me. If your man prevails, then we will be your slave. But if I win, all of you will be slaves to me and my people. Every morning, every night, here comes the giant. You could feel the ground shake when he was walking. This was the ultimate champion fighting machine. Intimidating. Then he began to mock them and even their God. Where is your God? He would say. And, and there's other dialogue there. I defy the armors of Israel. King Saul had no champion to match with Goliath. They were terrified. They were intimidated. For 40 days, twice a day, Goliath made his challenge. The Israelites had no answer. 
And then number three, point number three, we see the courageous one appears on the scene. David tends sheep. That's what he did. He was a shepherd. That's not a glamorous job. That's not a, a, a big star. He, remember, he's the underdog. He's out in the field with his sheep. David had left the palace to return home and take care of his aging father's sheep. David's three older brothers had already gone to join Saul's army. They were in the battle. The brothers were there in the battle. I, I identify with this so much because I was uh, a little boy and two of my brothers went to fight in Vietnam. And man, I remember so graphically. I remember when we drove them to the Knoxville airport and I saw my two brothers get on the plane to go to war in Vietnam. I, I was, it was extremely, I was just uncomfortable in my spirit watching my two big brothers go off to war. Well, that's what David, his, his bro, older brothers had gone to war with the Philistines. Jesse had not heard from his soldier's sons, so he sent David to go check on them. Now remember, there's no CNN, there's no whatever news you prefer to watch. There's, you didn't know. And this is his father, and his boys are in the war. And he said, David, man, I need you to go check on my boys. Go see how they are. <coughs> in fact, I want you to take some roasted corn and ten loaves of bread to your brothers. Take ten cheeses for their captains. Come and give me a report of the battle. I, wanna, I miss my boys. I want to know how goes the battle. David, Please go check on Check on your brothers. David left his sheep with a keeper and headed to the battlefield. Number four, the camp. Now this was, this was how war was done. You, you had your camp and you, you had strategy and you're watching and you're aware of the enemy and you're waiting. It's you're waiting on what their move is going to be. So, so David reaches the camp. When David arrived, he saw the two armies overlooking the valley of each, on each hillside. David left the food with the officer in charge of the supplies and ran out to find his brothers. But David found no battle. Just both armies camped on the hillside. Number five, the conflict. That was about to happen. It couldn't keep going like it was. It's going to end somewhere. And it didn't look good for the Israelites. David sees Goliath. The giants. By the way, have you identified your giant? He's probably not a nine and a half foot guy. It's a bully. But you've got one or two or three. It may be your job. It may be a person. It may be a circumstance. It may be a disease. You have giant of fear. Something that you don't want to deal with and you don't want to address it. And you're afraid of it. And you're intimidated perhaps by this giant. David saw it. He saw it. There he was. I challenge you to identify your giant. Go ahead and look at it. Go ahead and see it. Don't hold anything back. Go ahead and admit it. Define it. Address it. Size it up. Because if you avoid it, it will only get bigger and stronger and more intimidating. David saw his job. What's yours? Your job may not be like anybody else's. In fact, maybe there, maybe nobody else knows about your diet. It may be really private. But it's there. And it's mocking you. And you can't get rid of it. And it intimidates you. And sometimes you just want to give up. I can't win. I've tried. I've prayed. I've fought. David saw his giant. And, and folks, let me, whatever your giant is, it's not 
as insurmountable as Goliath was. You may think it is. It may seem to be. David found his brothers. While talking, he saw Goliath come out and heard his mockings. He was shocked that no one from Israel responded. He kept waiting for somebody to do something. Come on, y'all grown men. What's wrong? What's wrong with you? He observed that the king had promised great rewards to a champion to face Goliath. The king had said, if there's somebody that will be our champion that will fight this giant, if you were to, to prevail, I will give you riches. I'm the king. I will give you my own daughter, which means you'll be the heir if you can just defeat this giant. Nobody. Nobody. No one would step forward, including David's brothers. Then David said, <laughs> in fact, let's read it. Here verse 26. David spoke to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of a... Are y'all going to let him talk about your God like that? Your families, your mothers, your wives, your children? Is there nobody? And he later said, Is there not a cause? Sometimes you've got to stand up to the book. Now, I'm not advocating fighting, okay, parents? He'd step back off the ledge. <laughs> well, maybe there's a time. You know, if, if you're, I was taught, I was taught, no, don't fight. Don't be, the, don't be like that. But boy, somebody talks ugly about your mama. If somebody talks about your God like that, maybe it's time to take a stand, church, country. You know, we're going to let him drag our God through the mud like that? David couldn't get it. He couldn't get it. He's like, is there not a cause here? This guy's mocking you and your God. And then he said something that shocked everybody. I'll go! And his brothers have got to be like, church, I've got to remind you, it's not about the obvious things. It's not about his outstanding military training. Because he had none. It's not about his incredible state-of-the-art technology. Because he had none. It was about this fire inside his belly that God the Holy Spirit put in there. And he says, I'm sick and tired of letting him mock my God. I'm going to do something. How about you? Are you the one that's going to say something at school when nobody else will? Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard it. He was embarrassed, he was angry. 
And he's like, David, you arrogant little punk. Will you just be quiet? You're embarrassing us. What are you even doing here? That's what they ask him. And then, of course, in verse 29, he says, I came to check on you. What are you doing here? Is there not a cause? You're not even a soldier, David. You just came to watch the battle. You wanted to see some good violence, some bloodshed. David wouldn't back down. Other soldiers heard this bravery of this young man, and they went and told Saul. King Saul immediately sent for this. Send this, bring this kid up here. He was curious, and he was desperate. And then he saw who it was. Number six, the call to fight. And we're winding it down here. David volunteers to fight Goliath. There's no need for everyone to fear. Don't lose courage. I'll be your... Think about this. Guys, relax. I got this. This... Not even a soldier. The ideal... You know what? I love being around kids because they're, they don't even know enough to be afraid. They're so idealistic. I'll go. I am afraid. There's something really refreshing about that. Mm. David volunteered. Saul wouldn't have it. You're only a, you're only a lad, a young man. You have no experience against this kind of a warrior. David pleaded his case. He said, no, wait, wait, I killed a lion with my bare hands. I killed a bear. I'm pretty tough. I can, I can handle it. And then he said, with our Lord's help, I can also kill this heathen Philistine. God helped me kill the bear. He helped me kill the lion. He helped me kill this guy. Saul was somehow convinced. Go ahead. May God be with you, verse 37. He saw David's faith, his idealism. He had no other plan. And he offered him his armor. Verse, or number seven, I'm sorry. The concern. So, so the decision was made that, okay, we got nobody else. I'll let David go fight Goliath. And everybody's like, dude, no way. And so number seven. David refuses the king's armor. They brought Saul's armor. Saul was a big guy. And, and there's lots of... I've explained to you about the armor. There's the shield and the sword and the helmet and the, the things that cover you up and protect you. A coat of mail, a bronze helmet. The best in the world. The best in the, of the army that he had. And it was too big. It was too heavy. It was too bulky. And it didn't work for David. And, and nothing fit. He couldn't even walk. He tried to put it on. He couldn't... It was uncomfortable. David said, So, I don't need your armor. You don't need somebody else's armor. You got your armor. God gave you your abilities and your talents and your mind. You don't need to be like somebody else. Be you. Don't always be, Well, if I just had this... No! You don't need that! Be you! David defeated the giant without his armor. He didn't need it. You, you know what? You and I don't, we probably don't need all the stuff we think we need. If I just had this, life would be wonderful. No. No. That is a road that will never end. If all you're chasing is a house, a bigger house, a better car, a, a job that pays a little bit more, you don't need it. God has given you what you need. You don't need somebody else's arm. God will protect me, and He'll be my armor. What about you? America, can we just learn to be satisfied with what God has given us? It's enough. 
Number eight, the clash. Here it is. There's nothing left. No more putting it off. No more delay. It's time. David picked up his shepherd's staff, his stick, because he was a shepherd. That's what he had. That's the tool he had. Whatever your tool is, pick it up. You may be an artist. You may be a, 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 have good. You may have brains. You may have organizational skills. Whatever it is, God's given you. Pick it up, and let's go to battle against the devil for the kingdom because there is a cause. He picked up his shepherd's staff and he headed toward the brook which separated them in the valley. All the soldiers were poking out and this was it. And they got to be thinking, this is what it's come to. We're sending out a boy to face their champion. This, we're in serious trouble. At the creek, David stopped and he picked up five smooth stones. And they got some of them got to be thinking, what is what in the world is I, I don't know this. In his hand was his sling. He put the stones in a bag. I don't know this. Perhaps he stopped and said, Lord, God, I, I need a look. Remember you boy down here? Big guy over there. I don't know. Big guy. You and me, we bigger this giant. He's a big guy. But me and you, God, we bigger than him. I believe you will help me. Of course, can you imagine Goliath's response? This arrogance pompous, angry at first, <coughs> disgusted, mocking. You're sending a dog? You mock me with a dog? A shepherd armed only with his sling and his staff. <laughs> I'll tear you to pieces and feed you to the birds. David didn't run. David said in verse 45, You came at me with a sword and a spear and a shield, and I'm coming at you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. Amen. Folks, that's all we need. We got all we need. David had all he need, and he was the only one out of the whole army that realized it. Who cared that he was a boy? It didn't matter. Today, my Lord will defeat you, and I will cut off your head. So all the world will know there is a God of Israel. The battle is the Lord's, not mine, verse 47. Whatever your giant is, whatever your battle is, it's not yours. Give your battle to God. It's His battle. It's not yours. Are you, are you sick and tired of dragging that on your shoulder? Is it? Aren't you tired of that? Goliath was filled with rage. He began to move toward David. It was on. It's about to go down. And it probably won't last long. Number nine. We close the conquest. David reached into his bag. He took a stone. Now, remember, David wasn't a trained technician at war. But he was pretty good with his sling. Guess what he'd been practicing all those years out in the field with his sheep? He was pretty good. He knew his sling. So he got a stone. See, he got what he was good at. Take what you're good at. Put it in a sling. It's not a slingshot now. It's different. We, you know, when I was little, we, we made this. This is different. When we were in Israel, we were in that valley, and, and we picked up stones, and I took my belt off, and, and I tried to do a little sling thing. And sling the stone. I wasn't very good, but he got that sling out. Of what do you think the giant's thinking? Seriously? It 
was over. Down goes Frazier! <laughs> Has it come to channeling Howard Cosell in church? <laughs> it sunk like a bullet into the giant's forehead. The one unprotected place on his body. He was covered everywhere else. <coughs> the giant fell. Face first. David jumped and ran and stood on top of the top. He drew Goliath's own sword. It was a big one. The Philistine army watched. I wonder what they would think. They saw their champion laying dead with the young guy standing over him. And he held it up in the name of his God. He said, look here. Look here what God can do. Look what my God can do. And he shook it in front of the Philistine army. And guess what they did? Ran. They ran. Guess what your enemies will do if you pick up the armor of God that he's given you and have faith and courage and hold it up and say, look what my God can do. They ran. Greatest upset in history. Bigger than App State being mission. <laughs> the Israelite army chased the Philistines back to their own country. They were energized somehow. The army of Israel came alive. They were a little bandwagon. But man, good for them. Whew. We won. <clears throat> David became an instant hero. God gave a great victory to a shepherd boy named David. Because of his faith in his God, God delivered a whole nation of people. The giant boasted what he would do. David boasted what his God would do. There's a difference. Don't be getting all cocky and full of yourself. Because you're in for a big fall. If it's all about you. But if it's about your God, you claim it. And you believe it. David was not afraid to trust in his God. Plus, he practiced. He was not unprepared. Applications, and I close. You know what? You're not going to face this week a nine and a half foot giant that I know of. That would be really unusual. But you're going to face a giant this week, maybe today. A sin that kicks you every time. You can't beat. So you've just given up. I can't win. It's hopeless. <coughs> a fear that dominates you, that controls you, a guilt that is so deep that you can't get rid of it, and it comes up every time you get ready to move forward for God, here's this guilt, depression, that is very real, and it controls you, and it chokes you, and you can't breathe. <coughs> An addiction, Perhaps nobody else knows about. Pride. Self. A bad temper. Evil thoughts that you can't defeat. Laziness. Dishonesty. Disobedience. Jealousy? You fill in the blame. You. It's your life. You have a giant. Or two or three, as in my case. How are you going to handle your giant? 
I'm going to tell you something. You can defeat them the same way David defeated the giant. By faith in his God. No way to defeat Goliath as a little shepherd boy. No way. Only in God's strength. Second Chronicles 32 8 says, God will fight my battles for me. Set, or set 1 Corinthians 15 57. Thanks be to God, which always gives us the victory. Invitation. I want you to think. I'm going to pray. And, and as I pray, I challenge you. Face your giant today. Will you? You don't want to. I, I don't. I know. It is. I don't want to face my giant. I just know it's there. It's always been there, and I can't get rid of it. But it's there, and I'm tired of it. I'm tired of losing. Face your giant today. How am I going to do that, preacher? Well, number one, you're going to identify it. There he was, Goliath. There he was, right there in front of everybody. Big old, scary, intimidating, stinking giant. What's yours? Get it out there. Name it. Identify it. Look at it. Face it. And then I'm going to ask you to do this as I pray. I'm going to ask you to pick up your stone and your sling. And join me right here in this altar. It's not much of an altar, but it's a place to pray. Perhaps you are just sick and tired of being sick and tired. You don't have to live that way. Is there not a cause? I want you to pick up your sleeve today. Quit being a victim. Quit being a victim. God don't want you to be a victim. God wants you to be a victor. His goal, His plan for you is to win. I'm going to pray. Let's have everybody stand. As joy plays, I know you don't have to come to the altar, but if you want to move out and, and just for your own self to step out and say, I'm going to come and meet you at the altar, and I'm going to pick up my sling and my stone today. I would invite you to do that right now.
to help me face my giants. And, and God, help me not just battle, but help me to win. I give myself to You. I place myself in Your hands. I want to be Your soldier. I want to be a warrior for You. God, I give You myself right now. Help me to defeat my giants. And God, I'm asking You to fight my battle for me. Whatever it is this week, all of us here, God, You fight for us. We, we trust You and we claim You and we believe You. And so God, the Holy Spirit, empower us. Deliver us today and this week and give us victory. God, we have no hope without You. But Lord, with You, we have all hope. And we claim it today. And we thank You for this story. God, we love You. Lord, bless this church. Make us a powerful warrior in this community. God, help us to be fearless for the cause of Christ. Forgive me when I fail you. God, you know I'm weak. Help me to be strong. We trust you and we love you. And we celebrate victory today. And it is in Jesus' name that we all say together, Amen. God bless you. Thank you, church. Uh, next week, one more on David and uh, David and Jonathan next week. We'll talk about friendship. Thank you, Gerald and Karina, for being here from Romania. I love you all. Please go by and say hey. Have a great week. We love you. You are dismissed.